You may be familiar with Singapore's signature skyline. To house a population that has tripled since the 60s. The city built up. Now it's heading in a new direction. The future is underground and the plan is ambitious. Layers upon layers of critical and gigantic urban infrastructure built beneath our feet. We are going to use underground space extensively in the future. There's no choice for us. Deep beneath us lies a world that few have seen. I love the underground because there are many unknowns inside there. Probably to a lot of people, you know, the underground space is dirty, but as you can see, the conditions of underground can be no different from the surface. We meet the men who work in these underground spaces. Some of them say, isn't it like going down to hell or the underworld? But I don't see it that way. Being underground just seems a bit more like underlaw, that sort of thing. And they've imagined building a future deep beneath. In the event of nuclear holocaust, you know, we can actually activate a lot of these unutilized spaces. 60 years ago, you couldn't have imagined a place like this. Singapore is running out of space for the living. No one knows this better than Johnny Tan. My father was Johnny has an unnerving relationship with Singapore's underground. Singapore's dead can be buried for up to 15 years. And with a need for space both above and below ground, business is booming for Johnny. Tonight, he and his team are getting ready to exhume a 30-year-old grave. Johnny's work is not for the faint-hearted. Gangang while the dead move out of their underground homes, researchers at Nanyang Technological University are trying to persuade the living to move in. Unfortunately, in Southeast Asia, we haven't uh, gone further than the, the believing the underground is uh, more for the burial, for the parking lots and storage space, uh, things that we don't want. 
Singapore is taking a holistic approach to moving underground. They hope technology and design can help alleviate the monotony and claustrophobia associated with underground spaces. If you look a little bit up, upwards, I will increase the ceiling height and maybe you can tell us how you feel. Oh, wow. This is really realistic. The space has suddenly turned a lot more spacious. This simulation looks like an old computer game, but the team uses it to observe how slight changes in environment affect productivity and mood. Adding a single plant can give the illusion of a happier and healthier space. So each of these little holes has an electrode in it, and that electrode can pick up electrical signals from the surface of the head. They can tell us a lot of different things. We've run this test in a different laboratory above ground. In the, we haven't seen any differences specifically for underground versus above ground with brain activity. To counter negative perceptions associated with the underground, the research team has developed a brain hack. One of the main concerns with the participants is that they feel isolated from the rest of the world. So we have built in this simulated window and we actually can see live feed from outside. And they will then be connected with the rest of the world. Then to them, no difference. To them, it actually that make no difference whether you are 20 storeys up or five storeys down. In 2015, a law was passed allowing the government to acquire layers of underground space under private land to develop public projects. This was a critical step towards realising the dream of a future underground metropolis. They called this vision the Underground Master Plan. But building underground also means circumventing hidden obstacles. Underground Singapore will look totally different from above ground. Well, I think that people will be thinking, what is this crazy guy doing out here in the public under the hot sun? Why is he pushing a lawn mower over area where there's no grass? My main focus is looking out for underground pipes and installation. Jesse and Victor's job is to make an accurate three-dimensional map of subterranean Singapore so that urban planners can navigate the dense and complex networks below the surface. This is critical to executing Singapore's master plan. On the surface, it may just be another footpath, but their scans reveal unseen structures of a city. Powered by one of the deepest electricity supply projects in the world. We built the tunnel so deep uh, mainly to avoid the existing utilities and services underground. Ryan Wong is an underground engineer who works in a tunnel almost 197 feet below the ground. Unveiled in 2017, these high-voltage cable tunnels crisscross the country below Singapore's train tracks and sewerage systems. Sixty years ago, you couldn't have imagined a place like this. Most of our electric cables were hung overhead on the streets. Eventually, if we had kept them up, they would be super messy. In Singapore, we are all about being neat. It makes it easier to maintain and renew the cables. Ryan's job involves scrutinising each and every part of the tunnel for possible faults. You will feel like it all looks the same to you and you actually lost track of where, where you are. And of course, the, the tunnel is very big. It's not possible for a human to be able to see each and every part of the tunnel. Luckily, Ryan has a star team player. This is our automatic inspection vehicle, uh, the AIV. It 
can scan and map the tunnel because it has uh, a scanning capabilities and it helps us pick up anomalies in the tunnel. Probably to a lot of people, you know, the underground space is, is dark, it's wet, it's dirty. But I think as, as you can see, underground space, the conditions can be no different from the surface. Singapore plans to move more than just cables underground. A whole ecosystem, including roads, water reservoirs and electricity plants, is in the works. But some individuals are taking a more grassroots approach. Bjorn Lo is a rare breed of Singaporean who has left his cushy job to become a farmer. Uh, a lot of people feel that growing food requires a specific dedicated area to grow, but essentially it, you, you don't, it grows anywhere. They are plants. They need nutrients, uh, soil, water and light. After working in farms overseas, Bjorn took up the challenge of growing food in Singapore within the cracks of the concrete jungle. We have really limited land, right? And there are these uh, potential tunnels and bunkers or viaducts that can be activated. So it's being creative and being able to think outside of the box. Bjorn has taken to converting disused military bunkers into a patch of arable land. In an underground bunker, there's no sunlight, there's no light. Um, and plants will not thrive unless you put lights in, uh, which is, can be quite expensive to set up. Why don't we look at things that thrive in the dark? The cool thing about mushrooms is that once it colonises, they don't need much. They just need moisture, simple light, uh, but darkness humidity, 90 plus percent, and they will thrive in that environment. Right. Hi, JQ. OK, how many bags are we moving? Um, the six. Six. Bjorn is taking his mushroom grow bags to one of the World War II military bunkers that lie unused across the city. If his idea works, this old naval storage space will be given a new lease of life. Definitely first time coming into the bunker is like a wow feeling because of the height and the vastness and the depth of the space. I think in the future, there is going to be a big strain on global food supply chains. There might come a day where food may not come, but we can actually activate a lot of these unutilized spaces with this kind of technology to grow food for the masses. Bjorn's experiment could pave the way for self-sustained underground living. We can double stack the, the top. So. In an ideal situation, um, kind of build a compartment for it. But um, if the mushroom grows, then we can make these changes to make it more efficient in the future. Um, but this is a test to see if it actually grows uh, in this environment, which we think it will. So let's, let's see in a week. The total number of military bunkers in Singapore is unknown. And Chris Lee, an urban explorer, has made it his mission to locate as many of them as possible. I believe every structures and buildings that are built, there will be stories and I would love to find out more about it. It took me a few months to find out this place. I got to go through all the old books, the maps, the old archives and old photos. 
is trying to locate a bunker built in the 1930s, possibly the first underground office in Singapore. His investigation leads him to believe that the bunker is somewhere in Mount Faber, one of the oldest parks in central Singapore. I think this could be the place. Jackpot. This 224 square meter complex, known as the Faber Fire Command Fortress Plotting Room, was abandoned when the British surrendered in 1942. You can probably close your eyes just to imagine how this place used to be. This 83 year old military complex was used to house British naval personnel. Even though they were holed in, they could accurately pinpoint enemy ships hundreds of kilometers out at sea using maps and electronic calculators. All the things that I research, they're able to see it in my own eyes. It's, uh, it's very amazing. I hope that more places can be preserved so that for the future generation, they're able to see the thing physically and re correlate to the history rather than standing at the empty space and, and just tell you, oh, this is what it used to be. They can't really imagine what it used to be. Thirty kilometres away, Bjorn Lo is trying to make the most of these existing underground spaces. He's checking in on his mushroom growing experiment. This experiment means a lot to me because if this works, it means we can really start making plans about using these underutilized spaces and also about being self-sufficient. I hope this works out. contaminated. On top, if you see over here, it's all grey and brown, and that is the mole that's invading. What we hope to achieve from this, at least to see some of the bags fruiting, uh, none of them fruited. Not a great outcome, but you know, at least we, we know that um, before doing this, there needs to be a lot of um, changes done to the bunker in terms of ventilation, ensuring that it's, it's a more contained environment. Through the whole seven years of doing urban farming and trying to find underutilized space to activate them to grow food, uh, we have had a lot of failures, but it spurs us on and pushes us on to find uh, a correct solution for the future. Um, and, and it's great to sometimes to fail because then you learn from failure and you can get better um, at, at the work we do. The underground proved hostile for Bjorn's mushrooms, but this doesn't mean that life can't thrive underneath the surface. 35 kilometers south on the island of Sentosa, Lim Hong Yao is looking to track down some underground dwellers. To locate these creatures, Hong Yao will have to descend into a secret structure strictly off limits to the public. Underground dark places are void of predators like snakes, and so they can kind of nest in peace and roost in peace. So this kind of helps them with their survival. Yao is here to study the Arodramus fuchifagus, 
also known as the edible nest swiftlet. Swiftlets are prized across the region for their nests, and this is the largest known colony recorded in Singapore. The nest is made by the swiftlets using their saliva, and it hardens to make a cup shape that is attached to the wall. But Hong Yao, a research ornithologist, isn't here for the valuable nests. Swiftlets are really interesting because it is quite rare for birds to be able to nest in underground spaces. Most birds, they nest in like the trees. To navigate in complete darkness, these swiftlets have developed echolocation like bats. This means they use sounds to navigate the space around them. There are only two avian groups known to do this. So the swiftlets do it in the form of clicks, as you can hear now. This discovery is actually new to science. To find out where these birds come from, Hong Yao will have to go deeper into the tunnels. When we see swiftlets in the sky, we don't know which species are they, we don't know where they come from. What we are doing here is, to, is trimming the feather so that it becomes really short. The tag kind of stays in place. We are trying to attach GPS tags to the birds so that we can find out where they feed and where they go in the day. Just a little bit more, then I can attach the tag. OK, I think that's good enough. This lone tagged swiftlet could provide data on the species migration patterns and help us learn how animals adapt to the underground. Information that can serve as inspiration for humans hoping to follow suit. Comprehensive map of Singapore's underground metropolis will probably never be made public for national security reasons. But some parts of the plan are known to be found below very familiar settings. I spent about a quarter of my time underground. It's quiet, serene, and I'm able to focus and carry out my work. This is the Stanford Detention Tank. This is the largest stormwater detention tank in Singapore. Sitting more than 98 feet below the Singapore Botanic Gardens, this nine-storey structure can hold 15 Olympic-sized swimming pools of water.
Parts of Singapore are prone to flooding when there's periods of really heavy rain in the monsoon season. We are in the tropics after all. My job is to build huge drains to cater to intense rainstorm. Instead of widening existing drains in congested areas above ground, engineers used the laws of gravity to divert rainwater underground. Excess stormwater gets channeled into the tank. After the rain subsides, the water gets pumped back out into the Singapore River. By building the tank underground, we save about 4,000 metres squares of space. James makes routine checks on the water pipes to ensure that all is in order before the next rainstorm. The work actually carries on 24-7. The most challenging part of my job is uh, to balance my family time and my working hours. My wife, she always complains, so she don't quite understand. Until uh, I brought her down, then she saw that actually the structures here that we are doing is huge and one of a kind in Singapore. So finally, she understands. She will still nag at me, <laughs> but uh, she nag with understanding. Unveiled in 2018, this engineering marvel is the precursor of the kind of complex mega-projects that could go underground. 30 kilometres to the west of Singapore lies an island reclaimed from the sea. Here, Edmund Ko can boast about having the deepest workplace in Singapore. Some of them say, isn't it like going down to hell or the underworld? But I don't see it that way. Edmund has to travel 492 feet below the surface to reach his workstation. Here, Eight kilometres of tunnels sit on top of giant caverns dug out of the seabed, used to store liquid hydrocarbons. Oil companies lease storage space in the caverns, much like a warehouse, and Edmund is the manager. Storing oil underground has saved Singapore more than 80 football fields of space. But keeping it stored here takes a lot of hard work and skill. When filled up, the five caverns can hold over 9 million barrels of liquid hydrocarbons. Worst case scenario for underground is to have a uh, fire. To prevent uh, fire, we have to ensure that there's no leakages underground. Edmund is doing his final checks. Above ground, an oil tanker is waiting to offload its cargo. Once given the green light, Edmund turns a valve that connects the ground down to the caverns below. After the shipment of liquid hydrocarbons is safely transported into the caverns, Edmund calls it a day. He has taken to life underground. Having a sense of humour helps too. If the end of the world comes, like maybe a zombie apocalypse, probably we can hide in the rock caverns or something. Digging below ground is Singapore's alternative to reclaiming land from the sea. Land reclamation helped the country grow its surface area by 25%. But this expansion strategy has a ripple effect on the fragile marine life surrounding the island.
This group of marine biologists are setting out to monitor the resulting effect on life underwater. The team is here to check on this year's mass coral spawning. Coral spawning is interesting. Now, corals are animals. A lot of people think that they are uh, rocks because they are hard, but they're actually animals. They can't move around. They can't meet their own kind. So the only way for them to reproduce is to basically release eggs and sperm into the water column. So these larvae will then settle down and create new corals. And to us, monitoring that gives us an indication of the health of the reefs. The corals in Singapore's waters spawn for four days after the full moon. The team is diving at dusk when they can best see the signs that the corals are ready. Here we go. So most people don't expect Singapore to have corals. It's not very obvious, uh, it's not what we are known for. But um, Singapore is part of a wider region, the region of highest marine biodiversity. Corals in Singapore play a very important role. They build the coral reefs and when they build the coral reefs, they create the structures and the complexity that allows other animals to come. So if you have corals that are building reefs, then we would expect other animals over time to populate the coral reefs. is looking out for signs that the corals are ready to spawn. But they are proving hard to find. A bit less than what I expected. <laughs> so it wasn't fantastic. I thought there would be more. They came for spawning coral, but witnessed bleaching instead. This is due to the rise in Singapore's water temperature. So we know that uh, these events have a direct consequence, direct role to play in the reproductive ability of corals. Without corals, you will not have coral reefs. So they're really important for the uh, survival of all the species that coral reefs support. Karen and her team pack up for the day, hoping for a more fruitful dive tomorrow. Other nighttime adventures underground are just about to begin. Basically, in Singapore, anything that's too loud actually attracts a lot of unwanted attention. So, by having a soundproof and secretive location, it allows us to let loose and go crazy. Wilson Chua provides an unusual service to people in the know. He is taking his clients to an underground space where no screams will be heard. You can hardly hear anything from outside, actually. Oh, wow! Oh, wow. Wilson organises speakeasy-style all-night rave parties in unique underground spaces to get around noise restrictions in the city. I mean, in Singapore, it's actually very, very rare to have like underground gigs and stuff like that. 
I think the moment that they enter this space, right, it felt like they are uh, cut off from the outside world. It doesn't feel like Singapore in the first place. Living in Singapore, having a you know like day job and everything, you know we are usually like really proper-ish. You know there's a certain way that we have to be, and being underground just feel a bit more like uh, under law that sort of thing. And when we come, can come here and kind of just let go of all of that, and just kind of be a bit more of ourselves. It's a new day, and Karen's team of marine biologists are back at the docks. All right. Hi. It's not very clear today. Yeah, I mean. A bit like yesterday heading out, so hopefully we'll get maybe yeah. five, six metres visibility today. Yeah. So. Clear waters with good light. Wow. Yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> It's near the end of the short four-day window that corals in Singapore spawn, and tonight is the team's last chance to document it. We thought the last two nights we'll see a lot more corals spawning, and we did not. So it was a bit disappointing over the last two nights. Yesterday it rained, so the rain could have impacted spawning. Today the weather is beautiful, we have clear blue skies, and if everything holds, we hope that tonight will be a good night. All right, folks, let's rock and roll. Swirling pink floating cells called gametes are what Karen and her team have been waiting for all year. It's one of nature's most spectacular events. These species of coral are both male and female, simultaneously releasing bundles of sperm and eggs, which will mix with other bundles further down the reef and ultimately settle down to create a new generation of corals. Spawning is a, the event to me is an event that uh, sparks hope. Well, we are really worried because the past few years hasn't been really great for coral spawning in general, largely because of elevated sea surface temperature, a result of climate change. It was pretty darn good tonight. <laughs> There's a lot of activity, um, very short period of time. A lot of corals were just spawning left, right and centre, so it was quite exciting. It was good, it was good. Yanni, yes? Carolina? No, I can test here. Oh, maybe fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is Multipora. Okay. And this was A delicate universe lurks beneath us, out of sight, both in the water and underground. It's still dark outside, and on the mainland, some workers are just clocking in. Your attention, please. The last train for the day has departed, and the station will be closed shortly. Every day, more than three million trips are made on Singapore's trains. 141 feet beneath the city lies nearly 200 kilometers of tracks, and they all need to be serviced before a new day begins. We need to work when others are asleep. It feels like we are actually preparing some sort of magic. Wun Kai Jin's job is to deliver the equipment required for fixing faults on the train tracks. But unlike your average wrench in a toolbox, his tools weigh more than a thousand tons and can only move at a speed of 40 kilometers per hour. We only have about two to three hours window period for our maintenance work. 
Tonight, Kai Jin has to deliver these special machines to the downtown line some 98 feet underground. Forgetting a single bolt could mean a lot of disgruntled commuters the next day. In the underground, it feels to me that the time passed very fast. I'm afraid that we cannot finish our work on time. Our last train stops at about 12.30 a.m. The first train is about 5 to 5.30 a.m. We actually have a cut-off time before we need to carry out the work. We do not want to jeopardise the next day train operation because of our maintenance work. Getting to the location is half the battle. Now that the tools have reached the engineers, they have just two hours to fix the fault on the track. While the engineering team rush to get the job done, Kai Jin can breathe a sigh of relief, knowing he's played his part for Singapore's commuters. Most of Singapore's transportation network is going underground, including trains, buses and pedestrian links, sheltered from the heat and tropical rainstorms. For Ian Nailey, the underground provides shelter of another kind. The very first time I performed was when I was nine. That was an exhilarating feeling for me. There was this group of boys. They picked me up from where I was sitting at, opened up the uh, rubbish bin, the lid, put me inside and poured green tea on my shirt. I was just one of those kids where you'll see and like, okay, this is an easy guy to pick on. The teasing is a cause for my shyness. The idea of performing in front of a large crowd makes my stomach churn. I would vomit. Uh, because I was so, so nervous. That's why I started performing under the tunnel. The acoustics underground are really good. It makes my voice sound bigger and it's been helping me build my confidence. I want to do like live performances, see the reactions of people and hopefully in the next two years or a year, I get to perform somewhere bigger. That's my dream. The subterranean may seem like another world, but its many layers are becoming part of our everyday reality and the possibilities are endless. Underground, oh, underground Underground, oh